Vandora is uh, a slum community built on the rubbish dump of Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, Peter is one of those guys, he, quite typical story in one sense, he dropped out of school when he was very young, found himself addicted through trying to deal with the boredom in his own life, addicted to alcohol and to drugs, drifting his way to self-destruction. Paralyzed by hopelessness, Peter would say to you today, without a change in his mindset, without disrupting his mindset, he would be dead. But in 2014, Peter came along to one of the emerging leaders, Leadership for Life programs in his community. And it was a day that he said that disrupted his journey because it disrupted his mindset. It was almost as if, you know those machines that they use in the hospital when somebody's really not very well? It revived him. It brought him back to life. It woke him up. And then he began to change his thinking so that he could begin to change his life. And it was a catalyst, not only for personal transformation for him, but for transformation across the community of Dandora and beyond. Within just a few months, a small group uh, around him had managed to set up nine different community projects. One of those projects alone had reduced the number of rapes on young girls or young women, uh, rapes or murders in his community from less or from, on average, more than one a night to less than one a month in just the space of a few months. And Peter's actions created a ripple effect that inspired thousands of youth across Dandora. You walk into Dora, Dandora now, it's a safe place. It's in, included them, many of them going back and re-engaging in their education, or setting up businesses, or um, cleaning up their community, improving the security, and reducing crime. You walk around the streets with Peter, everybody calls him the doctor because he's the guy that made the place well. And uh, the thing about Peter is this, is that he's a great guy, special guy, but he's, and he's unique, but he's no more special than you and I. You see, every human being is full of the potential to be able to do extraordinary things. And that includes you and that includes me. So I don't know whether you can see it or not. It's so small, you probably can't. It's insignificant. Not particularly very impressive, but I hold in my hand a seed. A seed that is full of amazing potential, just like you. But at the moment, it's asleep. But if, just like Peter, we can wake it up, we put it in the right environment, give it the right opportunity, we wake it up, guess what? What I hold in my hand is not just a simple seed. It's a feeding program that has the capacity to meet the needs, not just of the city of Kigali, but the whole of the country. The question is this, is that if we are all full of this amazing potential, what is it that keeps us small? What stops us from fulfilling that potential, from reaching that potential in any an area of our lives? Well, let me give you an equation to help us understand this. You see, our performance, what we do, all right, our performance, and whether that's in the world of sport or education or music or dance or art or in our relationships with our families, our performance, what we do, equals our potential, that amazing potential, what we could do, minus the interference that stops us from doing it. And sometimes in our life there's a little interference, but sometimes there can be lots of even growing interference in our lives. And the higher the level of interference in our lives, the greater impact it has on our performance. So if we want to increase our performance in any and every area of our lives, we want to build and grow and develop our capacity, then what we need to be able to do is that we've got to be able to disrupt and deal with the interference. Interference has many faces. There is external interference, interference created by the environment in perhaps in which we find ourselves. The level of violence or crime, corruption, inequality. Perhaps it's the lack of available resources for good education. Or perhaps it's a lack of good resources or available resources or finance. And they need to build a part of the interference that is out there. But the greatest threat to us and to our human flourishing is not what's going on out there. It's the interference that's going on 
in here. It's the conversations that we have with ourselves. It's what we believe about ourselves and what we tell ourselves. Shaped often by the interference that's going on around out there. And passed on often from one generation to the next, to the next, to the point at which we find ourselves paralyzed to possibility. And what are some of those conversations that we have? Well, let me just share a few examples with you. And let's see if you can recognize any of them in your own life. I recognize them in my own. The first of those is what we call hopeless thinking. It's that voice in our head that says, you can't do that. You can't. You have that big assignment that you've got to complete. And you go, oh, it's just too difficult. I can't do it. I can't do it. Or you've got that job that just seems a little bit too far out of your stretch. I can't do it. I, couldn't. I can't apply for that. And that hopeless thinking keeps us small. Or perhaps it's lazy thinking. We're going to smash that assignment. We're going to sit down. We're going to do it. Or is, this is the time when I'm going to get myself fit, fast, and in shape. I'm going to get out there on the roads and I'm going to smash it. But then we've had a tough day at work or at university in our studies. We get home, it's just like our, that voice in our head says, do you know what, I can't be bothered. Or perhaps it's our fixed thinking. Steve, you always seem to be anxious, tense all the time. You always seem to be late. It's just the way I am. My granddad was like that, my dad's like that, I'm like that. It's just the way I am, I can't change. It's fixed thinking and it keeps us small. Or perhaps it's our stuck thinking. We know that there are challenges or problems in our communities. We can see them. But we're stuck waiting for them to fix it. The government, or the governor, or the chief, or the lecturer. We're waiting for them, and it keeps us small. These poverty mindsets impact us so much in every aspect and every area of our lives. And you say, Steve, they're just talks, they're not important. No, but they matter. Why do they matter? Because of this. Because our thoughts affect our feelings, which affect our actions. What I think affects how I feel, which determines what I do. And so if we don't deal with those disruptions, then it's going to continue to impact our actions. And the reality is that without mindset change, the story stays the same. In communities, in countries around the world, the story will stay the same without mindset change. But what we've discovered in emerging leaders over the last 10 years, working in approximately 16 countries around the world, with many thousands of people from different colors and creeds, genders, different contexts, is that the same principle remains true. Is that when you can disrupt your thinking, when you can change that thinking, when you can help somebody to become aware of their thinking, to own it, and then to disrupt it and to change it, then they can begin to change their lives. They can change the lives of their families, of their finance, of their children's education, of their future. And when we liberate the capacity for human potential, The only thing that is restricting it is our imagination. And yet, what we discover time and time again all around the world is that when people are delivering programs aimed at building and developing the capacity of human potential to human flourishing, is that almost entirely the focus is on technical skills. And when we don't get the results or the response or the impact that we would hope, what is the solution? Well, we just teach more technical skills in the hope that at some point, in some way, at some time, something might take root. But we shouldn't be surprised that we're not seeing the impact, perhaps, that we would hope. Because if you imagine, we're not, but imagine that we're in a drought season right now. And we're longing and we're waiting for the rain to come and the clouds build and we see the clouds and we're excited. And the rain falls from the clouds and it pours down onto the ground. But the problem is that because it's drought, it's all got hard and it's got compact. And a little bit manages to make its way in. And yet so much of what's good and what's needed actually disappears off down the road. And is lost. But if we first disrupt and break up the soil, then it creates an environment that is ready to receive what it's good and what it needs 
and it creates an environment for growth. And it's exactly the same with us, with our thinking, with our human flourishing. It's exactly the same. If we can disrupt our thinking, change our thinking, then we can change our lives. If we can disrupt, we can allow that environment where what's good and what's needed can penetrate and get inside of us and begin to change and transform us so that we can unlock our potential, transform our reality and rewrite the future. Simple, you say? Yes, profoundly so. Easy? No, definitely not. If we were to go out and head out into any of the communities around here, around Kigali, you would find in any of those communities tracks that at one point somebody walked and then the next person came along and then followed the same path. And over time what's happened is that those paths, whether it's on foot or on motorbike or on cycle, is that we just continue to follow those same paths. But if we want to cut a new path, de define a new destination, it takes strength and it takes effort, right? To try and ride across the ruts that have already been cut. It's not easy. It's much easier just to drop into the same old ruts that we've always travelled along before. But if we'll have courage, if we'll set our sights on the goal that we want to achieve, if we're willing to stick with it and work with it, we can find that we can create a new route. And eventually, over time, as we practice it and as we discipline <coughs> ourselves, that new can become the natural. And it's the same in our thinking. If we have the courage and the conviction to disrupt those old negative mindsets, to own them first, to disrupt them, recognize them, do something about them, and then begin to change them, to choose a different route. It's not easy, but it's worth it because we get to a different and a brighter destination that's available for all of us. So instead of my hopeless thinking, which says that I can't, now when I begin to hear that, I say, no, no, Steve, come on, I can, I will, I'll find a way. Instead of that lazy thinking, which says I can't be bothered, I'm going to go, no, I'm going to make the effort. And when I start to think it's just the way I am, I will remind myself, no, Steve, take the risk to grow. And it's exciting what begins to happen in the life of a human being when they begin to disrupt what's not working in their mind. I, want to, I could share with you many stories from around the world, but I want to share with you just three. Three stories from here in Rwanda from just the last few months with projects that we've been involved in. One was just a few months ago, working with a bunch of head teachers and teachers up in the Rulindu district. And one of the head teachers shared with us, admitted that he had problems in areas of discipline in his life, particularly around timekeeping and around finance, which meant that he would never arrive for class on time and children were missing out on their education. And so what he did was he learned how to disrupt his mindset, his old pathway that he used to walk. Now he's arriving early. His, his lessons are planned, prepared and delivered on time and well. The children are engaged and guess what? The staff are now following his example and it's changing the culture of the school. He shared with us that in just three weeks, following his mindset disruption, he had managed to save $210, 200,000 Rwandan francs. And this was a guy that was struggling in debt. And then he set up a leadership club in his school, in his primary school, and 82 students uh, signed up for it, and he began to share the same principles that he'd learned. And in the space of three weeks, this student had managed to save $130, 120,000 Rwandan francs, primary school children. What's um, amazing as well is we did some work up in Sawate with um, some of the tea pickers up in Sawate. And many of them were very fearful about the future. Hopeless thinking was consuming them. But as they learned how to, they could disrupt that mindset and reset their path. They set up income generating businesses that provided additional income for themselves 20 or 30% on top of what they were already getting. And provided employment for 179 other people in those communities and has a positive ripple effect on 3,500. Or perhaps it's the 735 graduating uh, teachers that we've worked with this past 12 months from Rwanda University. The statistics say that on average less than 50% of them will manage to find 
a job in education or stay in education because they're not able to earn the income that they need to survive. Within two months, 46% of them have set up an income generating business that enabled them to add an additional income to their um, salary of uh, $46. 43,000 Ryan and Frank, which means that they'll stay in school, they'll stay teaching, and they'll give the children the education that they need and that they deserve. So imagine how we could change the story if we could put the mindsets, motivations, and skills to flourish at the center of the educational system in this country, or in any country. From kids right the way through to graduates, into every youth, national youth initiative, into every project that aims to set up every community and transformation in this country. Imagine the ripple effect that we could create in our own lives and in the lives of others. In a paper that was written called The Power of 1.8 Billion, written in 2014 by the UNFPA, and they said this, with the right policies and investments, and the engagement of our youth in nurturing their potential. The largest generation of young people in human history can become the problem-solving producers, creators, entrepreneurs, change agents, and leaders of the coming day. That's available for you and it's available for me. My, uh, our host said right at the beginning, I love his quote, was it, um, disruption is not a threat, it's an invitation to change. And when we accept that invitation and change our thinking, then we can change our lives. And when we change our lives, we create a ripple effect that begins to transform the lives of others. Thank you.